that we may be bearers of your grace to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And would you remain standing as we sing our gathering hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. It's number 11 in the Reclaim Hymnal, or printed on the screen. <laughs> God who knows us, you have shown us what is good, but we have looked to other lights to find our way. We have not been just in our dealings with others. We have chosen revenge over mercy. We have promoted ourselves instead of walking humbly with you. Forgive us our sins and show us your salvation in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. People of God, you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God poured out in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Hear the promise first given in your baptism. You are God's child. 
Your sins are forgiven. Rejoice, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Charged up again, so he prays 
to his dad in heaven. Do you know what, friends? We get to pray too. We get to plug into God. We get to be charged up by God through prayer. Any time of the day, it doesn't have to be the morning or the night or the afternoon, any time during the day, we can plug into God and he will charge us up. When we're feeling sad or angry or scared or alone or we're feeling happy or we want to say thank you for something, we just have to say good good and gracious God, thank you so much for what you've given me. Or good and gracious God, can you help me through this? Or good and gracious God, can you come be with me because I'm just feeling a little, a little scared, a little alone, a little nervous, a little sad. And then all we have to do is plug in. It's like our wireless charging. We talk to God and he says, well, I'm going to be there for you. Just like I was there for you. That's what this promise that he listens to each of us. And there's probably hundreds, thousands of people who are praying at the same time. And you know what? God is so big and so good and so mighty that he listens to all of us. And he promises that he's going to do whatever you ask in accordance with his will. He's going to do what you ask if it makes his plan happen. Okay? Let's pray about that. Let's give, a, let's give God a little prayer of thanksgiving uh, for, for being able to pray. Congregation, will you pray with us? Let's do an echo prayer. Dear God, yeah. thank, you thank you for the gift of prayer. of prayer. Thank you, Thank you. For, charging me for charging me when I feel, when I feel alone, alone, sad, sad scared, scared, anxious. Scared. I come to you, come to you. And, you and you listen. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go on over. One piece of candy for yourself, or two if you're going to share with another person. Understanding is 
now and ever. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the water. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain from the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food, and to the young ravens that promise. If his delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord makes pleasure in those who fear him, and those who hope in his steadfast love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 27. And Paul writes, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for hosting, for necessity, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I will have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I am made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessing. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? But only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, I do not box with one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
can be both exciting and dangerous. When a woman is expecting her first child, the joy can be almost suffocating. The baby showers, the nesting, the anticipation of bringing new life into the world. Brides and grooms waiting in expectant bliss for their wedding day can almost become nauseating for the rest of us to look at, the hand-holding and the kissing and the giggling. Expectations have the ability to bring great happiness. And yet, expectations are also dangerous in that when they're dashed, our faith often suffers. What happens when that new baby that comes into the world is born with a congenital defect? What happens when two years after that bride and groom come to the altar, the marriage starts to fall apart? We expect that this new promotion is going to bring us fulfillment, but it only brings us more stress. We expect that as our children get older, the parenting will become easier, when in all actuality it only becomes more complicated. We expect that our retirement years are going to be smooth sailing, relaxing, and enjoyable. But our bodies hurt, and there are new challenges to battle, expectations. Especially when expectations go unrealized, become burdensome. Now that our Lord Jesus is on the ministry trail, the number of people who have come to him with their own expectations on what he should do and how he should act is going to grow. Today's gospel text comes right on the heels of last week, wherein Jesus cast out a demon in the Capernaum synagogue. And as the curtain came down on last week's text, we heard that the fame of Jesus really took off. The word is out. A new rabbi has come to town, and he has supernatural healing powers. But now that Jesus' trip to the synagogue is complete, he retires to the home of Peter and Andrew only to find something amiss. Well, two things are amiss, actually. One, Peter's mother-in-law is in bed with fever. And two, the table is unset for the Sabbath meal. Neither of these are insignificant problems. For starters, fevers in the ancient world were nothing to mess with. There was no ibuprofen or Advil. There was no way to replenish electrolytes. Fever are, is often the sign of an infection and perhaps a life-threatening one. But the other issue shouldn't be overlooked either. Hospitality in the first century was highly important. Not unlike Lutherans today, who can't seem to gather without a donut or a cup of coffee, the Jewish people took their meals and their family gatherings very seriously. To not have the Sabbath lunch on the table for her guests would have been very rude for Simon's mother-in-law. So Jesus takes on both of these conundrums. With the same ease that he cast out the demon with just an hour before, our Lord easily wins the day over a fever. And he saves Peter's family from the embarrassment of shame of sending their visitors away with empty stomachs. Well, as you might guess, the word of Jesus' second healing of the day only adds to the excitement that is traveling through the region. When the sun dips below the horizon and nighttime falls, the Sabbath is over. This means that the healing work is now officially legal. But it's also legal to walk somewhere other than the synagogue and to drag a mat with a family member on it to Jesus so that he can heal them. I love the description that Mark gives us here. He says, And the whole city was gathered together at the door. People living distressed and disordered lives. People with horrible, disfigurating, infectious diseases. People nearing death. The acute and the chronically ill turns Peter's front lawn into a triage center. And Jesus works through the night. One by one, wading through the crowd, making broken people whole again. It isn't until the wee early morning hours the next day, with the sun still hiding behind the hills, that Jesus is finally able to slip away to pray, to catch his breath, 
to grab even just a moment for himself. And yet that solitude doesn't last long. Simon Peter comes looking for his new master, and Simon Peter's words are informed by the expectation that the community had for Jesus. Everyone is looking for you. Lord, get back to work. There are people still in the waiting room. I don't know about any of you this morning, but I can completely relate with Peter. How many times have I, have I made expectations Demands, even, of God. How many times have I laid out my agenda and my plan before him, insisting that all he needs to do is just rubber stamp it? Because certainly, my will and the will of God are in a line with one another, right? How often have I mindlessly mumbled over those words in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, but actually meant, my kingdom come. My will be done. And I don't know about any of you this morning, but I can imagine that Peter and the people of Capernaum were not just confused, but a little offended by Jesus' response. We're moving on to another town. But Jesus, there are plenty of sick people here. But Jesus, you haven't dealt with everyone that has come to you. Simon says, Lord, I've got a line of people expecting to be seen and healed. It appears, at least on the surface, that Jesus is being cold-hearted. But Jesus doesn't actually care about these people anymore. And if there's one thing that you and I have felt a time or two in our lives, I don't think there's a person here this morning who hasn't fervently prayed and then been disappointed by the outcome. Whether that outcome is God saying no, or whether it's God bringing about an answer in a different way, it's a tough still to swallow. Or how many of us here this morning have had the same item on our prayer list for weeks or months or even years, and we've seen little to no movement from God? How easy it would be for us to think that God is just simply absent. Has God moved on to a different town and left me in the dust? Because I can't see God working on my behalf. My child still has cancer. My finances are still in the toilet. I'm still searching for a job. The nations are still at war with one another. My family is still a mess. The list goes on and on and on. And meanwhile, we see our neighbors, like Simon Peter's mother-in-law, be miraculously healed. Our friends from high school are living the high life with a nice home and nice toys parked out front of it. My colleagues at work seem to have the perfect family. Is it all arbitrary, Lord? Or have I just not believed enough? Or obeyed enough? Or tithed enough? Have I just not been faithful enough? Why are you moving on to the next town when the world is craving it, craving it around me? Why would Jesus leave Capernaum with unfinished business? Because the cross is not in Not to turn up is the focal point of Jesus' ministry and life. Why? Because on the cross, Jesus will do battle with the darkness and with the sickness and with the root of that which causes our lives to fall apart. Our failing bodies, our broken relationships, our heartaches and pains, our jealousies and our lustings are all symptoms of a more massive, more chronic, and more fatal disease. Sin. And it's sin that our Lord Jesus has come to take upon himself and defeat. In response to Peter searching for him, Christ says, Let's go on to the next towns that I may preach. 
there also. The miracles that Jesus performs in Capernaum are side posts to the main event, his word. The healings, the changing of water into wine, the walking on water are all signs that point to something, or rather someone greater, Jesus. morning who are sitting in the valley of the shadow of death. To those of you who have been praying the same prayer for longer than you can remember, to those who are convinced that God has left you sitting in the darkness and moved on to someone more lovable and more worthy, I proclaim this word to you. Jesus left Capernaum that morning and journeyed to Golgotha. For your eternal life. Jesus left Capernaum that morning not as a punishment to the people who had yet to be healed, but in order that complete and total healing may come through his innocent and suffering death for the world. Our God has not and will not ever abandon or forsake you. And while our God has not ever guaranteed that all of your problems are going to be solved, has never guaranteed that all your bills are going to be paid and that your family will even be whole. And while our God has not ever guaranteed that your will is going to be done, he guarantees something better. His will is going to be done. And his will is to bring you salvation. darkness will not win. The waters will not overwhelm. To those of you convinced that God has forgotten you, hear this. One day he will do for you exactly as he did for Peter's mother-in-law. He will grab you by the hand and raise you up by eagle's wings and draw you to himself.
friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in this peace and in community with one another. Let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated once again. At this time, we will offer our prayers for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all, whatever their need may be. Let us pray. Thank you. 
one God, now and forever. Amen. The sound of a baby talking in church. That's a holy noise, isn't it? <laughs> the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father. For in the night of his betrayal, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the very same way, when the supper had ended, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink of this, all of you, for this cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me.
go forth with this benediction and bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our sending hymn is On Eagle's Wings. It is an insert in your bulletin. Uh, the verses are on the front of it. The chorus is on the back. Would you please rise as we sing together?